Now on to our session. Welcome everyone to this panel discussion supporting mental health in Usher syndrome. I'm Krista Vazzi and I'm the executive director of the Usher syndrome coalition. This session is part of the coalition's annual Ush Connections Conference. Mental health is a topic that we're often asked to address, and last year we received such positive feedback when Rebecca Alexander was our featured speaker for our Ask the Therapist session. So this year we're so fortunate to have a panel of four individuals who all have experience working with the Usher community. Today, this esteemed panel will try to answer as many of your questions as possible. We have some pre-submitted questions from the Whova app, and we also are taking live questions that you can submit in the Q&A area at the bottom of the screen. It should be at the center on the right-hand side. We'll do our best to get as many of your questions answered as possible. While you start submitting your questions, I'd like to invite the panelists to introduce themselves so we can start to hear directly from the experts. Rebecca, we'll start with you. So hi everyone, I'm Rebecca Alexander and I have Usher syndrome type 3A. I am a psychotherapist in New York City and uh, I am very happy to be with all of you and to be participating with this panel today. Thank you, Rebecca. This is Krista speaking. Ashley Benton, would you please introduce yourself? Hi everyone. Hi y'all. My name is Ashley Benton. I am the deaf blind. I am deaf blind myself, and my sign name is A in the crook of my arm. I work for the Division of Services for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. I am the deaf slash deaf blind coordinator for the state of North Carolina. We have seven regional centers, and we provide services. And our mission is to make sure deaf and deafblind people have access or equal access to communication, access to information. My position, I provide support to seven regional centers and seven deaf specialists and two deafblind specialists. We, I provide training and support to make sure they have the support they can do their, to do their job. So before I worked at North Carolina Division of Services for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, I was a mental health abuse substance use therapist and a clinical social worker so that's me i'm really lo looking forward to being with you today and i'm honored to be on this panel with you thank you ashley this is krista speaking deb marinos would you please introduce yourself hi i'm deb marinos and i have ushers 2a i'm 63 i live in oregon I am a counselor. I am also a teacher. I started life as an electrician and um, then went back to school as a vision became more difficult to do construction work and became a counselor. And also I teach, um, I have a company named Adaptability for Life and I teach um, counselors how to be more culturally competent, medical people and families help with that and they also do coaching for people with ushers, their families and their support personnel to, you know, figure out careers, find their way through barriers, whatever systems or challenges are presenting. We work together to develop a plan to get where you want to go. And it's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you, Deb. Lisa, would you please introduce yourself? Yes, hello everyone. I am Lisa Rowinski. Um, I am truly honored and humbled to have been uh, asked to participate in this panel uh, as a hearing incited person. I am a nationally certified American Sign Language interpreter um, and uh, I have a special interest uh, in the area of working with deafblind individuals. Um, I've been an interpreter for approximately 20 years and have worked um, very specifically with uh, deafblind um, individuals, people with Usher syndrome for about 15 years. Um, I also have a master's degree in counseling and have worked with people with Usher syndrome, both as an interpreter and in a counseling capacity as well. Um, so I do wanna emphasize that my 
um, knowledge, uh, research experience is, is anecdotal. It's based on my observations um, and not on my having uh, hearing or um, sight loss. I am hearing and sighted. So I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you, Lisa. So we will, this is Krista speaking, we will start off with a few pre-submitted questions from the Whova app. And first, I'd like to direct a question to Ashley. For those who cannot afford to see a therapist or receive counseling yet, what can I do today to help me with the anxiety of losing the abilities of navigating social cues and through the depression of losing so much independence. For example, no longer being allowed to drive. Ashley, please. Hi everyone, this is Ashley. Yeah, I just want to address that question in two parts. First, well, it, it's a big word, anxiety and depression, right? I wanna focus on anxiety first and what anxiety means. For people who know, mostly uh, it's, people think it's fear of something, anxiety and worry, right? I recommend first to think of it um, as what are you really afraid of? The question says anxiety about, you know, uh, so missing out on social cues. Is it a fear or is it a fear related to that they will figure out there's something different about me, that they will cap catch me in uh, the game that, I'm, uh, that I have Usher syndrome? You know, so those are the two fears. So if you view it from the person um, opposite me, that they're going to catch me and just let them know, be upfront, say, hey, I'm deafblind. I have Usher syndrome. I can't see well in the dark. I can't see uh, in my peripheral vision and beat that fear from the get go. There is no concern there after you do that. So that's a common uh, anxiety for people who have Usher syndrome. Uh, they'll, they'll, they're concerned about other people viewing me and judging me and thinking there's something wrong or I'm different. So just letting them know from the beginning that I'm deafblind. That, and, and now we're talking about inclusion that, and diversity. Just disclose that from the beginning and that will uh, iron out that issue. I have Isher syndrome and I say, hey, I'm deafblind right away. And it really relieves, it gets it out in the air and it alleviates any anxiety. I just let them know. And I let them know my accommodations that I need. And then I feel so much better. The other one, the other part of the anxiety is missing out on cues, social cues that I might say something inappropriate or off topic. How do you handle that? There, it's just viewed as an opportunity to learn. There are other tools that you can use too. I used to be a therapist. A big part of my job as a therapist is to be able to observe my consumer and their facial expressions and how they're um, using their body language. If, but as I lost my vision, how am I gonna capture that? How can I continue working as a therapist? At that time, I realized I needed to learn another way to get that information. So I called an SSP to sit with me and give me visual environmental information. Also, I used tactile interpreters that they would give me the language and they would also include emotional cues or social cues that I would be missing. And so I did use a tool called haptics and it's touch that gives me visual environmental information and it's discreet, it's on my back. They would do tears if the person was crying or laughing or if somebody was rolling their eyes, there are different symbols that indicate what that person is doing. And I felt so much more confident. I also use it during presentations. Like I wanted to know what my audience was doing. And so haptics provided that way for me to know what was going on with my audience. So I could, so I kept the connection with my audience and I, we had the same playing field and it was discreet. I had the full picture of what was going on. So I learned that new tool to empower me. I felt more confident. So I would highly recommend, rec recommend that for people to look for ways to add to their communication and add to their toolbox of ways that they can get us that information. And also I do tell people from the beginning, I need accommodations. With that aside, the, the conversation about 
depression and feeling independent. Depression is part of the grieving process. So yeah, we have to go through that grief. You are losing something. You are losing your vision or your hearing. You are losing something. So it's okay to go through that grieving process. It's really necessary. It's important to go through the grieving stages. But the good news is the depression is one of the last stages, but there's no hurry. Everyone goes through the grieving stages in that process differently and in different ways. Some take a few steps forward and then go back. And it sometimes comes up every once in a while during their whole life, but you get through it and know that you'll be fine. I also encourage you to actually, if you are grieving and the question also says grieving the right things or losing my independence. You have to question, are you really losing your independence? Like me, Ashley, I can't, I don't drive, but am I really losing my independence? But I, I learned in or, or orientation and mobility, I have actually access to transportation. So I'm not really losing my independence. I can be independent still. That issue of losing my independence Maybe, yes, I am losing my ability to drive. I can grieve that. I remember my car, that it was a red sports car before, and I missed my car, and I accepted that. I grieved it. I grieved the loss of my car. But there are other things and other ways I can gain independence. You can ride with friends, which is better than riding alone. You know, you can ride on the bus and read on the bus, which is better than, you know, watching the road while driving. I can text my friends. And I forget, oh gosh, my friends can't text and drive, but I can ride and text. So focusing on the positive aspects of it. That's what I recommend. Thank you, Ashley. This is Krista speaking. Lisa, please. Yeah, hi, this is Lisa speaking. Um, I just wanted to um, take a moment since Ashley, you ended on discussion of um, independence and the term independence. Um, I wanted to talk about that a little bit, and you talked a little bit about how you have found other ways to be independent in your daily life. But uh, one thing that I actually learned from a deafblind person is uh, the term autonomy. So um, a lot of people aren't familiar with that term, or if they are, they equate independence with autonomy. And um, just as you talked about being able to find other ways to live independently or more independently, um, the fact is that we as humans, we all depend on other people and other tools to live our lives um, every single day. Um, so I'm not sure that anyone is ever really truly independent, not to minimize not to minimize in any way the loss of uh, ability to drive. But um, autonomy um, is a powerful word that I think uh, perhaps can help reframe the concept of independence. Autonomy meaning the, meaning the ability to make your own choices and the ability to uh, make those choices without any um, pressure from other people, without any advice from other people, and without um, any um, kind of force from other people. So hopefully while you have found ways to be independent and live independently, um, alternate ways, um, the sense of autonomy is something that I think that is really um, very important to people to maintain um, that ability to make their own choices about how they live their daily lives. Thank you, Lisa, for adding that. This is Krista speaking. Uh, we'll move on to our next question that I will direct to Deb. I am dealing with PTSD from having a lot of traumatic changes happening all at once in my life, learning that I have Usher syndrome being one of them. How can I feel safe and secure when my own body is betraying me and I have to rely on others? What can I do to help heal, help myself heal and recover emotionally and mentally? What can others do to help me in this process? So that's a really good question. And I have to be really upfront and say, tell you that I did not get this right when I was 30 something and going through all of those changes. I still go through changes, and fortunately, I've learned some new ways. I'm what's called a somatic mind-body 
um, focused therapist because the chronic stress, I mean, just think about it. You don't know what you're going to bump into next. You don't know if that ride's going to show up. Yes, you don't. You can be independent and make your choices, but you got to plan ahead. You can't just go, oh my gosh, I forgot the eggs. You're baking a cake and you got to go jump in the car and go get it. No, no, no. That doesn't work anymore. You got to have lists. You got to have this. You got to have that. And if you are like me, you had to do it all yourself. And that was very, very hard, very, very stressful. And that chronic stress makes you sick. So I have a recommendation. You need to do things like shake and dance and sing and get your body active and find places that it's okay to go punch a punching bag. Get the emotions out and do it safely. Imagery is so wonderful for being safe. And that is one thing I will say that I had when I was still out doing electrical work and it was scary and I almost fell down things and almost did this and almost did that. I did it for another nine years and I didn't. It was interesting. Before I knew what my eyes were doing, when I think about your betrayal, I broke three bones. When, after I knew and was got a little bit of training, not a whole lot, but a little bit of training and mobility, I didn't break anything else because knowledge is power. So there's a combination of accepting, as others have said, being independent, giving them the ability to know what you need is so important, but it's also very important to realize that this emotional stuff is real. And if you don't get it out of your body, it turns into other things and then it makes you sick. So then you'll have more stuff to deal with. But I think it's really important to accept that, I don't know, kind of make friends with your body, that it's not really betraying you. It came stacked with a certain deck, and maybe it's doing a really good job of handling that in a little different way. So if you would like specific resources, um, I teach mind body groups and they're available, but there's also this year the Center for Mind Body Medicine that I was trained at, which um, cmbm is .org, O-R-G. They have all of the skills, what we call mind-body skills, recorded. Dr. Gordon actually did a video for COVID every week. And so you can actually go on and learn all of these self-care um, skills. Anybody can for free. And and I guess the other piece would be is to find safe people. Not everybody's safe. Um, some people are going to be bossy and tell you what to do. And if you tell them everything, they're going to change what your life looks like. Some people are safe. And learning those people. And I find personally the people who have had some significant loss in their life are probably more likely to have less answers for how you're going to do it. Because each of us does it a different way. We each find a different way to get where we need to go and achieve the goals that we have for ourselves. Thank you, Deb. This is Krista speaking. I want to let all of the attendees know as well that we will work to compile a list of resources that are being mentioned by all the panelists today. And we'll share that with everyone after the session so that you know, there's a lot of information that's going to be shared. We don't want you to lose it. So we'll move on to the next question that I will direct to Rebecca. How does one deal with a lack of motivation? Isolation seems to trigger fluctuations of motivation, especially in a pandemic. Factors like low income, lack of resources, lack of services, feelings of hopelessness. What do you do when you feel no motivation? So this is Rebecca speaking, and I, I think there are a few things that we, lack of motivation is connected with a lot of, uh, of other things that are related to Usher syndrome and also not related to Usher syndrome. Because as someone who works both with people who are uh, deaf blind or who have who are low vision or who are hard of hearing or who are fully sighted in hearing, I find that 
uh, everybody at times struggles with motivation. And so the questions are why? And I think that one of the fundamental reasons why we struggle with motivation is because of a lack of structure. Structure is one of the most crucial things that we can create for ourselves that we need in our lives in order to have a sense of normalcy, in order to have a sense of concept of time. Um, I can tell you that I am a big fan of making lists. There are always things that we need to get done uh, during the day and we put them off and we put them off for all different reasons. And usually we put them off because when we have too much time on our hands, we actually, that's when we have the tendency to overthink. That's when we have a tendency to think of all of the barriers that are going to prevent us from being able to accomplish a goal. And it may be even as simple as brushing your teeth. So if your motivation is as simple as not being able to brush your teeth in the morning, then maybe that's where you need to start. Okay, that's my goal for today. It's brushing my teeth this morning or whatever the very simple goal may be and working from there. But I highly recommend creating some structure for yourself. It's much easier for people, I think, who obviously do have that built-in structure, whether because it's uh, it's school-related or it's work-related or it's family-related. But if you live uh, with other people and there are things, being deaf and blind, having low vision or being hard of hearing does not preclude you from being capable of doing many, many things. And so I want us to try to operate from a can-do perspective as opposed to what we can't do. And part of what Ashley mentioned and what Deb mentioned and Lisa mentioned is I think um, that you have to allow yourself to experience your emotions, to feel them. And oftentimes when we avoid so much, not just doing things that are active, but actually experiencing our emotions. I allow myself to cry all of the time. And I think sometimes when we see people in such short uh, spurts, we think, well, they've got their lives together. They know what they're doing. I had cataract surgery earlier this week. I've cried probably three times this week. And that was what I needed to do while I'm in this weird transition period of having one, one eye that's working a little better and one eye that feels more blind. And that's a part of that process, right? But if I didn't do that, I wouldn't be able to maintain the other structure that I have in my life that I've created for myself in order to feel motivated. So I also think it's important to think of um, your emotions and to think of your mental health. I, I made a food for thought video yesterday and it was sort of likening our emotions to similar um, way that we liken uh, our feelings about the weather. And what that means is we know that the weather is fluid. We know that it's changing. We know that there are gonna be days where it's really stormy and it's really rainy out and we probably don't even wanna go outside because navigating it would be uh, very difficult or we really need to have our rain boots and a rain jacket and an umbrella um, and it would be scary to do that, right? Well, we also know that it's not always going to be that stormy and rainy, but when it is and if we are going outside, we need to protect ourselves. And so if you're experiencing sort of those stormy feelings, so to speak, inside, what are some of the things that you can do to help protect yourself? We have a tendency when we feel down, anxious, depressed, to make ourselves feel even worse, to isolate even more, to focus on all of the terrible things going on in our lives or what we won't be able to do any longer, as opposed to seeing ourselves as someone who really needs some care, who really needs to uh, have some time and space to grieve or to connect with others or whatever the case may be. Um, I, I want to recommend to uh, all of you, and I'm happy to send um, Krista or whomever the links, but I'm actually playing with right now, and uh, for those of you who are low vision or not sighted, I'm holding up putty in my hand. I have four different types of putty that I play with, and I often do this when I'm in session with my patients. I do it so that I won't bite my nails. I do it so that I won't pick at my cuticles. 
I have these have all different types of scents for people like us who really rely on our tactile functioning and our sense of smell. This one smells like mint. I have lavender. I have rose. I have eucalyptus. So and they're not expensive. I think this whole pack cost me six dollars. And this is something that I always keep handy. Um, and I have found that for stress, for anxiety, for being able to channel some of these things that I might otherwise take out on my body and not even purposely, um, that it's been very effective in helping me be able to sort of use this as a, as a way of meeting out some of that stress. It was a very long answer to your question, but I hope it was somewhat helpful. Thank you, Rebecca. Yes, I think that was very helpful. This is Krista speaking. A lot of really great tips and um, more that we'll add to our resource list. Thank you. So this question has come in live and I'd like to direct it to all of the panelists. If each of you could say one thing to children and young people with Usher syndrome, what would it be? Do we have a volunteer for the first response? I'll, I'll chime in here just quickly. This is Rebecca speaking. Um, so my biggest suggestion first and foremost for parents who I, I'm assuming this is a parent maybe is that um, I think children really learn from parents. I wanna highly recommend for parents on this call that you seek the type of support and counseling, therapy, whatever it is that you need for yourself because children actually don't learn or don't know that they're incapable. They may have to learn how to do things differently, but they learn that they're incapable based on how they're treated, based on how they're educated, based on what their, uh, how their parents sort of handle things. I think that that's an important piece is, is I'm, I'm not addressing the children here per se, uh, and I'm, I'm happy to offer something there, although I'd, I'd love to hear what the other panelists have to say, but I really wanna, um, hone in on the parents, because I think that is a huge part of how we help nurture and foster self-advocacy in our children, rather than doing things for them, um, really teaching them to be able to see what they have and they're capable of and, and advocate for themselves. And mostly that has to do with developing our own comfort and ability to accept the terms of what our children's or children are living with. Thank you, Rebecca. Yes, Ashley. This is Ashley. Yes, I agree with Rebecca. She's right. Family parents can be the best model too. When a family uh, finds themselves in their network and other family members who have, other families that have somebody in, in it who has Usher syndrome, you wanna understand and have empathy through that and that connection. We wanna uh, find somebody that we can you know, work with that has is going through the same thing. And also having children with mentors and being around people with the same sort of things that they're dealing with, having that connection, that ability to um, talk about it with somebody else who's going through the same thing, that they feel I'm not alone, that this person's like me, I have someone I can talk with about this, which is really significant. Those who have that, you know, an older person who's a little bit, um, has gone through this and is more independent, realizing uh, that child can look up to them as a mentor, saying, oh, I can succeed. I can be who I want to be. I think that's really important. Mentorship. Thank you, Ashley. Lisa, please. Hi, this is Lisa speaking. Um, I think maybe um, more logistically, I would encourage, and again, this is uh, more for parents, but I would, you know, when I, uh, it's been my observation that when parents uh, get a diagnosis of a child with Usher syndrome, um, they're just kind of uh, paralyzed and don't know where to, where to go, what to do, where to find information, um, who to seek information from. Um, so really uh, for parents to, um, try to find those resources, find the resources that are going to help them understand Usher syndrome and um, help their children understand Usher syndrome and really just seek out the resources because there are a lot of resources out there. Um, and it's kind of one of those things that if you 
don't know about it, you don't know about it. So find a way to um, reach out and get in touch um, with resources that can help um, and, and they are out there. Just thank you, Lisa. Uh, and oh, Rebecca. Uh, just quickly, again, this is Rebecca speaking. One of my um, very, very dear friends who I believe is on this webinar now, Carly Fredericks, runs Ava's Voice. And um, two summers ago, before COVID, unfortunately, we couldn't run it last year. She is the um, founder of Ush This, the camp that we had in upstate New York. And it was such a tremendous experience. But more importantly, Ava's Voice does a lot of work in bringing kids together and empowering them. Um, and so I wanna really encourage you to, I don't wanna put more work on Carly's plate, but she is very well equipped. Um, and her daughter, Ava, who is also my buddy, um, definitely they, and Ethan and Gavin, Morabelle, there are so many kids who have Usher syndrome who um, are really thriving and they have such dy dynamic interests. All of the kids, at least that I know with Usher syndrome. So I wanna really encourage you to um, try to get your kids involved. Um, I know that when I was 12, this was way before the Usher Coalition existed. It was only the Foundation Fighting Blindness. And that was when I was first diagnosed with RP. We, there happened to be a conference in San Francisco near where I grew up and my parents brought me to the conference my twin brother came with me, he is not affected with Usher syndrome, to a kid's sort of nighttime group meeting. And to this day at 42 years old, I'm still very close friends with the, the kids that I met back then when I was you know, 13. Um, so those connections are so important. I totally agree with, with Lisa and with Ashley about having that sense of connection with other kids who live with similar issues. Thank you, Rebecca. This is Krista speaking. Before we move on to Deb answering that question, I want to touch on that response in terms of finding mentors. Uh, you've mentioned Ava's voice, and, and are there any other resources where people can find mentors, especially ones that primarily communicate in ASL? We do have that question from a parent, and I wanted to get that out there. Does anybody? Um, Go ahead, Ashley. This is Ashley here. So you can meet your mentor anywhere, really, in unexpected places. I met men, mine at the Helen Keller National Center before my parents were bringing me to different family events and parent organizations and camps and conferences, but I didn't feel that connection. I felt like I was, no one else was going through what I was going through. At that time, you know, at, at the residential school, the deaf school, I was the only one with Usher syndrome there. And I was like, where are the other people like me? In my early 20s, I went into Helen Keller National Center and there she was bright as a star and just immediately felt connected with this person, this independent woman who I just could look up to and I still have that connection with her still. Um, family, just it's important for them to expose them. Like Rebecca said, just going to camps and conferences and finding those groups to socialize with. And just that one special person will pop out. And that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> I consider myself very lucky <laughs> that I found mine. <laughs> Thank you, Ashley. This is Krista. Lisa, did you have something to add to that? Hi, this is Lisa speaking. I just wanted to add that I know that some of the state deafblind projects have um, initiatives that connect families um, with Usher syndrome um, within the same state. And um, so that could be another good resource uh, if you can reach out and find out uh, where your uh, statewide deafblind project is, contact them, and they can probably put you in touch with uh, a group of, of families um, where children have Usher syndrome um, and that can be a good resource as well. Thank you, Lisa. This is Krista speaking. Yes, that's one of the first uh, resources we provide when parents reach out to us, the coalition. We urge them to get in touch with their state deafblind project. That's great. Uh, Deb, what it, would, you, would you like to share one thing that you would say to children and young people with Usher syndrome? So I would say that you wanna have as much fun as you can and you wanna be open to as many 
different opportunities and especially any kind of speech training or language or ASL or whatever, even if you don't think you need it right now, um, my parents will practice denial extensively. And so I had a very different growing up. There wasn't anything that was taken off my plate because they said, oh, well, just deal with it. So it is possible to do many things that you would not imagine you can do if you just go try. You'll find a way. Thank you, Deb. So the next question we have, uh, I have this directed to Lisa and Deb, but, but anyone, please feel free to answer. What are some of the more subtle signs I can watch out for to ward off burnout from mental and emotional exhaustion from adjusting to life with Usher? What can or should I do about it? Can I take that or you want? Yeah. So, um, you know, for me, it's when I, my rubber elastic, I call it, I have this little visual picture in my head of an elastic band. And when it gets too tight and there's no more bounce, then everything is just, I'm, I'm reacting a little more quickly. I'm, I'm just kind of edgy, might be another word. Whenever you get there, I think the goal is to not get so close to the cliff where we fall off and we have a major upset because it's super hard to recover from. So if we can learn to somehow keep ourselves, you know, with a little more slack. So what do you do about it? You know, obviously I would say you're going to shake and dance or, or do something. But more than that, as others have said, you need enough time. You need the space, you need the safety, you need to cry, you need to do whatever you need to do. And to realize that it does take an enormous amount of effort to compensate for the vision and hearing and anything else that may be going on. So um, what does soothe you? I really liked uh, Rebecca's about scents. I have, I grow herbs, um, lemon, thyme, and holy basil and different ones are super important for me to be able to go out in my garden and smell and pinch off and and uh, having whatever spaces you need to restore so that you have some sort of safe places. Thank you. Lisa, go ahead. Yeah, this is Lisa speaking. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the difference between uh, kind of stress and burnout. Um, I think we all experience days where, um, you know, Rebecca talked earlier about motivation. Um, we all experience days where we would just rather stay in bed. We don't feel motivated to get up and do anything. And I think that that's, um, that's normal. That's based on, you know, regular stressors that we all experience in life. I think when it becomes burnout is when you have more of those days than not, um, and you find it more and more difficult to become motivated. Um, to get out of bed or to do simple tasks um, that um, are part of your daily routine. And um, so I think that the question, what can I do, what can I or should I do about it, um, probably has as many answers as there are people. So Deb just talked about how she connects with gardening and how uh, calming and soothing that is for her. Um, uh, something that personally um, helps me um, is I do a lot of yoga and Pilates um, and some and some breath work and I find that mind body connection to be extremely relaxing um, and extremely grounding um, and so I think that I guess finding that thing, something that um, you really connect with and that makes you feel good um, could be a good, uh, a good way to start. I also saw uh, in one of the comments on the Whova app, someone said, um, which I thought was a really great idea, is to, if you're, when you're feeling that lack of motivation or you're feeling burnt out, um, just start with five minutes. Um, I don't remember, it was one of the attendees who gave the suggestion and said, just tell yourself you're gonna do five minutes of whatever. Um, and 
I even, I find that is helpful for myself as well. If I tell myself I'm going to do five minutes of Pilates before I know it, I've probably done an hour of Pilates. So um, if you start with a smaller goal um, and uh, you can feel that sense of achievement when you've accomplished the five minutes, five minutes is a lot easier to kind of um, uh, feel motivated to do than to say, I'm going to work out for an hour. Um, once you, once you get started, sometimes getting started is the hardest part. So if you can start with something small, often it does turn into something bigger. Can I add just one thing here quickly, Krista? Yes. Uh, this is Rebecca speaking. So there's um, a saying that goes that your yeses have no meaning unless you can say no. And what I take that to mean is that we oftentimes have a tendency to put too much on our plate. I mean, I'm probably the worst offender, but um, I say this because when we say yes to doing so many things, to helping people, especially for those of us in helping professions, so much of our sense of purpose and our sense of value and knowing that we're needed and that, we're ma and that we matter comes from helping others, right? But we also need to be able to extend that uh, and have that grace with ourselves. So I encourage you that if you're somebody who has a tendency to say yes, to take on things or to take on new cases or whatever the case may be, that if you're saying yes to everything, it means that you're saying yes to things that you don't genuinely either A, have time for, B, want to do, or C, really feel that um, excited about. So if you're able to take a step back and think about what you're saying yes to and making very deliberate and intentional decisions about what you say yes to. It means that when you say yes to things, that you're saying yes to things that you genuinely are available for, that you want to do, or that you feel like are in your wheelhouse and that you can be helpful with. And that when you're saying no, it's not because you're being disagreeable, it's not because uh, I think maybe it's a fear of people not liking you or whatever, but it, it is only a disservice to you when you're spread so thin to, to say yes to something that you really don't have the time and energy um, to put into something that's been requested of you. So I, I want to encourage you to practice maybe even saying no to things and saying yes to the things that really feel like they're things that uh, you want to do. Thank you, Rebecca, for adding that. This is Krista speaking. Uh, and Lisa, when you brought up that tip that I also saw that in Whova, just five minutes, I will 100% be using that. <laughs> that. I saw that and thought that was perfect. Um, we'll move on to, oh, sorry, Deb, did you? Yeah. Please. I, I would like to just add to, for the moms, uh, Usher, who are moms, like I was, it's okay to simplify and it's okay to automate and it's okay uh, to add on to um, Rebecca's no. Your kids don't have to do what everybody else's kids do. They're, they'll be okay if they're not in three sports and if they're not here and there and everywhere. So um, it's really important that, you know, and even when I think about things like makeup or all, all this stuff, you know, I was in construction. I didn't have to wear makeup all the time while I was in construction. And it was quite a shock to realize there were all these standards later. So just look at those things. Be really honest with yourself about what matters to you. Thank you so much, Deb. This is Krista speaking. And your point leads really well into a question that we received live. As a parent with, with Usher syndrome with three young children, how do you cope with the shrinking list of active things to do with them? The stress of parenting already exists for sighted hearing parents, let alone doing this with diminish diminishing vision. I want to connect with my kids on their level, but it's hard to loosen up when I can't play tag or throw a ball with them. Would you or anyone else like to offer any advice there? Deb. Um, I will, this is Deb speaking. The, the ball thing, I played ball, but I only played ball with softballs, so I changed it to Nerf type things, so that when I got hit in the head, it was funny, and we had a great big soft fuzzy ball, too, that we used, and we did a lot more rolling, and we got those big plastic balls that we could um, tumble over, 
Um, so I would suggest an OT or a PT if you really need some bright ideas around that, because it is important to be able to do those things. And um, there's just a whole lot of adaptive kinds of sportsy things that you can do. That would be. Thank you, Deb. Another question that we received live, for those of us with Usher syndrome, what advice do you have on communicating our needs with the people around us? Often those who love us want to help, but sometimes I feel I don't know how to communicate what I need and how they can help me. Any volunteers? Rebecca? So this is Rebecca speaking. I was hoping Ashley would, would say something because I know that she has something great to add here. <laughs> um, but so, so to, to, I just totally lost my train of thought because I was so eager to hear what Ashley would respond to this. So maybe I should let Ashley go first. <laughs> this is Ashley. I was just thinking about, you know, I was be very blunt about what I need. And I've learned the hard way. When I was a teenager, I was in denial. I wanted to hide it. You know, I didn't want people to know that I was deaf blind or feel that I was different. Caused so much anxiety about myself. And I realized now it was a waste of my time and energy. I finally found my mentor, developed my identity as a deaf blind person. And my life opened up, I felt like. My energy was spent in the right place. I could advocate for myself. Um, I, you know, had my goals set and I refocused my energy. So I think as soon as you realize that, hey, I'm unique, I am deaf blind and let people know that and request those accommodations, advocate for yourself, get those trainings in self-advocacy, build your skills, look online. They have so many tips that are out there, but really to be straightforward with what works best for me, know what your needs are what your best needs for access in terms of communication, be able to clearly explain this is what I need. Like for myself, I need haptics. I need a tactile sign language interpreter, you know, those accommodations and voice them. And I think it's, it was easier for me after I was able to do that with my family. My whole family is hearing like many of you at the dinner table, everyone sits around and is having those conversations. And, you know, do I want to, abruptly face that? Or do I find something I enjoy while they're doing that? I read, for example, or I say, hey, come here. Let's have a conversation independently, one-on-one. -on -one. Let's talk about what's going on in your life. So that's how I kind of navigate it. You know, I am a reader. So, you know, it's hard for me when there's a group of people having conversations. So I try to pick out one person and say, hey, tell me what's going on with your life. What's happening in the family? And that's what's worked for me thus far. So this is Rebecca speaking. I wanted to add to what Ashley was saying. So I, I, I wanna ask everybody sort of in on this uh, webinar today, how many of us expect our loved ones and people in our lives to be mind readers? Right, we and I'm raising my hand as I say that because I think that we just want people to know how they should help us. We shouldn't have to figure out what we need. We don't wanna to have to think about what we need. We just want you to know what we need and we want you to know how to help us. And we want you to do it exactly the way we want it to be done. Can't you just do that please, right? And yet the best thing we can do in practicing self-advocacy advocacy for ourselves is actually starting at home or starting with your loved ones. So I, for instance, my stepmom is one of my biggest advocates and she's wonderful. She'll come and pick me up at work at night because I finish quite late. And she would always hold my arm as though she's dragging me with my, you know, for anybody who's done even the most basic of O&M training know that, you know, I should hold the back of her elbow, but she would grab my arm and I feel like I was basically being dragged like a, you know, six year old child down the street. And initially I felt badly, you know, because I know that she was doing everything she could help, but A, it was uncomfortable, and B, it wasn't giving me the information I needed from her body as she was walking, 
right? So I finally said, hey, Ma, this is how you're supposed to lead a person who is low vision or blind. Let me show you. And I showed her and hello, now I've never had, you know, pain in my neck from having my shoulder up next to my ear from her, you know, misguiding me. But so I think that sometimes we feel very frustrated about the fact that we even have needs. So we take it out on our loved ones. We have this wonderful ability to um, use our loved ones as sort of um, our, our point of um, our, our targets for our frustrations. And they're just as frustrated as we are because they really want to help us and they don't know how. So I want to really encourage you to sort of think about what it is that would be most helpful to you in any given situation. And also practice asking for that. So for me, for instance, if I was going to eat with someone or a group of people, I know that I can never sit with the light uh, directly um, facing me. I would have to have the light at my back. And rather than worry about inconven inconveniencing other people and asking them to switch with me, if I have someone sitting with the uh, light to their backs, then I, it shadows their face and I can't read any of their facial expressions or maybe even see their signs if they're signing to me. So these are little things that I know are helpful. And when we actually speak our needs and communicate them, we make other people's lives so much easier too. Thank you, Rebecca. This is Krista speaking. Ashley, yes, please. Yeah, just as a follow-up, because I know my personal experience, my husband, he's actually a sign language interpreter and people think, oh, you have full access at, as a, at home or anywhere else if you go to family events. You know, you have a built-in interpreter all the time. I do wanna caution you. Never rely on your family in those ways or even friends in those ways to, you know, put that responsibility all on them. It's not fair to your family members to expect that from them. So I purposely hire someone to help with communication needs that I may have at events. So my husband doesn't have that obligation. And I let my husband go and have fun with his friends while we're out. So that finding that balance that it's not a it's a relationship of give and take, not an obligation. Um, in your professional situations, I never allow them to use my husband as my interpreter. We have that boundary and ethically anyway, of course. I don't use him in my professional life, but we need to consider and make sure we have a balance with your family and friends that want to support you, you know, and don't use that same person all the time because they can get burned out from that relationship as well. So finding that balance. Thank you, Ashley. Deb, you have something to add? Yes, I wanted to add the education piece. So I have a handout that I'll be happy to send to Krista, but it has this basic principles I learned from my mentor, Carol McCall, that explaining to people some basics around blindness. And then also for families, that's the reason I developed my course, my little online courses, so that they can understand, they, they wish they knew they could see what you could see, and then they would be better at understanding you. I agree with Rebecca. No, they can't have a reader board, but there is education out there that will help them be more uh, aware why something is hard and something else is not. And so that, that they will know when they're putting the roadblock in front of you that they don't mean to be doing. So, um, but the handout I use is specifically like for medical providers or anybody else, because it's so hard to get all these like 10 statements out, like, don't push me, don't grab me, don't, you know, and it's much kinder to have something in writing that you can give people so that it doesn't seem so, I don't know, demanding, pushy, or it's not a stress on you for to remember it. Let's just put it that way. Thank you, Deb. Yes, I think any information we can provide to those around us ahead of time. It sounds like that's that's the way to go, educate them. All right, uh, we have another question that I'm going to direct to Rebecca, but any panelists can feel free to chime in. What are some helpful tips to calm anxiety when you enter a place you are not expecting to have, have sorry, to have light to dark adaptation issues or it is too dark for you to see it all and you are alone? Well, uh, so I think that sounds like story of all of our lives, right? 
Um, so this is Rebecca speaking. Um, so I, I would suggest one of the best things that you can do when you have to go somewhere and you're uncertain about what the environment will be like, what the lighting will be like, I highly recommend arriving early um, so that if there is a possibility for your eyes to adjust uh, at all, given the circumstances, and there's so many environments that I don't even think I could even potentially um, you know, give you case scenarios. But uh, for instance, I live in New York City and for whatever reason, everything here, not that we've been inside for so long, um, but restaurants, um, I guess everybody thinks it's fun and sexy to have the lights off. I personally hate it, uh, as I think most of us on this webinar do. But um, when, when I'm alone, uh, if I'm going somewhere that's unfamiliar, if you are someone who uses a cane, I would make sure that you have all of your adaptive technology with you, that you have all of your tools with you, so to speak, not just mentally and emotionally, but physically. So I would go into that situation with my cane. I would go into that situation with my cane because A, it speaks for itself. B, it's gonna help me navigate, but, but A, it speaks for itself. And so it will alert other people that I'm someone who might you know, need support or need help. Um, but the, it's a difficult situation. I would also encourage you, those are the times where I think we feel that greatest sense of overwhelm of, of helplessness, right? Of being afraid of not knowing what to expect and um, whether we're going to have our needs met. And so those are the types of, of times where you can really step outside of your comfort zone, develop greater comfort with the discomfort of being someone with a disability. But I promise you that when you are proactive in situations like that, when you speak your needs or when you communicate your needs and when you have your uh, adaptive technology, I have, um, for those of you who are low, low vision or not sighted, I'm holding up in front of me right now about three different pairs of glasses, not including the ones that I have on my face right now. And when I go places, I have all different types of glasses with me. Sometimes it's, it's uh, various types of sunglasses. Sometimes it's reading glasses. I'm in the middle of you know, doing cataract stuff. So all of these things are tools that I bring with me in order to have as much access as I possibly can. I also wanna encourage you, I have a mantra that I use. I encourage people to really um, allow themselves to, under, to understand and accept the discomfort of the situation because it is very uncomfortable and it's unsettling. And I think that instead of trying to fight it, but um, acknowledging that and still persevering and pushing ahead is gonna really show you just how incredibly resilient and capable you are. Thank you, Rebecca. Ashley or Deb, would you like to add anything to that, what you do in those situations? <laughs> no, actually she got it. This is Ashley, nope. <laughs> I'll just add one, this is Deb speaking, one piece. When I, I'm by myself, I try to find something. So I run through the door as soon as I realize it's dark. Obviously, I'll either have a dog or a cane to make sure I'm not falling down a set of stairs. But then I slide to the right or the left um, and so that I'm not in the doorway so someone else doesn't come in and knock me over. But I try to find a wall or a chair or a table, something to put my finger up against so that I don't have that sense of being out in the middle of nowhere because that helps ground and then wait until the eyeballs change or else listen, you know, obviously listen and smell because sometimes you can figure out something that way too. Thank you, Deb. This is Krista speaking. Uh, we have another question live from a parent. I have a five-year-old with an unofficial diagnosis of anxiety. How would you suggest that I help her cope with her future vision loss? What strategies can you suggest or do you use with difficult or new situations? I think you've spoken to some of them now, but specifically for a parent of a five-year-old. Maybe Rebecca? Sure. So this is Rebecca speaking. You know, it's difficult, right? Because a five-year-old developmentally where they are and what we know as adults and parents, what they need, um, there's, there's a difference there. And so you, we have to think in terms of what a five-year-old can comprehend 
this is a good time to help her, I think, develop some of her skills if she is already struggling with certain situations uh, in terms of being able to see whether it's at night, whether it's her periphery or vision directly below. For so many of us, our vision below us is, uh, is very difficult, right? So um, I, would, I would suggest working with her based on what's most age appropriate in developing other um, skills that could be helpful for her to navigate her environment. Um, I really like tactile training. I know that um, it's interesting that, you know, I don't know how you feel about her potentially learning um, Braille or even just doing some of the, the, the uh, sorry, children's uh, courses that they have. I know that they have apps certainly and interestingly, as, as you may very well know, that oftentimes children who are losing their vision <clears throat> first learn the Braille cells from, from seeing them and then sort of um, progressively learn to use them um, with their hands like tactile through, their, through touch. And so those could be some kind of fun games for her, not with like you're going blind and this is why you need to learn braille, but actually learning, helping her learn it as though it's sort of a cool and fun skill. Um, and may, there are plenty of games that you can use um, that can help her improve her tactile skills. Yeah. Thank you, Rebecca. Mm -hmm. Deb, you'd like to add to that? I would like to also say I was a very anxious five-year-old and we didn't know I had a vision problem, but I was very nearsighted. I found it a lot of like what um, Rebecca talked about clay. But I had a xylophone that I could beat on and I had a, um, I was the thing about drums. I don't know. I just had more, the more I could thump and beat and squish and run and jump. So like little trampolines, little jumping things, anything that is sharp, sudden movement seemed to be very effective in breaking up my anxiety. Thank you, Deb. Did you have something to add, Rebecca? Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to add to that, Deb. This is Rebecca speaking. Deb, I totally missed the anxiety piece, which was probably the, the most important part. I couldn't agree with you more, Deb. I think that those, um, I have children um, that I work with or parents that I work with, with young children uh, who have vision loss or who are neurodiverse. And I often encourage them to get what are known as urban rebounders or those mini trampolines. And they actually come with like a handlebar so a kid can jump on the mini trampoline and hold on, especially for children who have Usher syndrome and also have balance issues. That can be a good way to sort of channel that um, energy because I do think that being able to um, get that, the anxiety out in some way is important. So I, I think Deb, you're right on. I think there are a lot of really um, good ways of being able to do that through um, physical experiences as well. And also encouraging her to be able to, you know, to openly communicate. If she's feeling anxious, again, a five-year-old can't necessarily tell you why she's anxious, but just being able to foster and facilitate open communication lets her know that you're a safe person for her to talk to about things that she may feel afraid of. Thank you, Rebecca. This is Krista speaking. We're going to switch gears a little bit and um, take a relationship question that was pre-submitted. I have seen a lot of divorce and those with Usher syndrome and relationships with people who are abusive, alcoholic, or both. What are some relationship strategies to either prevent getting into destructive relationships or how to exit them? How do you prevent relationships from failing because of the progressive, progressive loss of vision and hearing becomes too much? Any takers? Lisa, please. Um, I'll, hi, this is Lisa speaking. You know, I'll just start um, piggybacking off of what Ashley uh, already communicated about her relationship with her husband, um, which is to uh, make arrangements for other people um, to um, assist or to be SSPs or to be interpreters and not um, place that burden onto your, um, your partner or a best friend or someone. Um, it sounds like Ashley um, and her husband have set, um, set up some pretty clear boundaries about um, their roles in each other's lives. And um, I thought that was really uh, 
I thought that was a really good piece of advice. Uh, thank you. Um, Deb, I saw your hand first, so you go ahead and then Ashley. So this is Deb, and I just want to remind folks that substance abuse and even some of the abuse and all of that, now we're talking post-traumatic stress, we're talking wounded people, we're talking people who are hurting. So um, the best way to avoid, I'm not sure that any of us have a corner on that, that's why there's so many books out there on the subject, but the reality is the more grounded you are and the better you know yourself, the less likely you will be to take something that is not what you really want because that we call it people pleasing in the counseling world. You know, you don't want to hurt somebody's feelings and tell them no, and you know that they're a problem. Um, so having strength in yourself and knowing your own value is probably the best preventative. I think as far as getting into it or controlling the outcome, um, you know, I was married 38 years and then it fell apart, but it wasn't because of my vision and hearing. It was because of, I got sick in addition and, you know, it was all about him not wanting to have to support himself. And so he thought that, you know, what do you mean you can't work? If I finally did have to stop working for a period of time, I'm working now, but it was very, very difficult, but people change when they get older and people have different expectations. You can't control another person. There's no guarantee that anything is going to last and that it's going to be perfect. So you have to look at what was good. I love my kids. I love my 38 years. Um, and then it fell apart. Not my fault. Thank you, Deb. Lisa, did you? Oh, sorry. It was Ashley. You wanted to add to that? Yeah, this is Ashley here. So as any marriage, it really requires a lot of work in open communication. I've been married 23 years, but I can tell you one thing is for sure. My husband and I, there's nothing like we were back when we started dating. We are both completely different people now, 23 years later. So as I think about it, I fell in love with a completely different person, but we try to learn and grow together, having open communication. So when we were dating, we loved our favorite thing to do together was watch movies. Right, watching movies is now something we can't do. I can't see the TV or watch movies. One of our favorite dating things to do was to go to movies and now it's completely different. So we had to navigate that together and he respected that I couldn't see the TV. So now our sort of thing that we do is he'll watch a movie with our, he'll watch a movie with our son and I'm in the room <laughs> reading <laughs> and it works. We're still together. <laughs> But that's it. I mean, we had to learn and grow and change and adapt together. So really, it's all about mutual respect. You respect their space and their friends, their time and my space and my time. And I'm independent in what I do and not relying on him too much. And it's a lot of work. Every relationship has ups and downs too. There is no perfect relationship. You have to go through it and communicate. You know, I'm like, oh gosh, if I say, I need help. If he's not guiding me the right way or we miscommunicate, we have to stop and back up and say, hey, let's solve this. Let's get back to where we can, you know, get connected again. The same with any couple. Really, it just takes work to get through it. I'm not trying to say that we're perfect or anything like that. But as other things, you know, you have to be careful with codependency, as others have said. You have to know who you are inside. And if I am a helping person and you get married or married with people who are very needy, and then later that relationship becomes toxic, but really that is, you know, there are signs early on that you can say that they're needy and I'm more of a helping person and it becomes codependent and it's not healthy. You can recognize that and, you know, have your own boundaries and um, yeah, be independent. Thank you, Ashley. This is Krista speaking. Uh, any additions to that? Any relationship advice or touching on that question? <laughs> Rebecca? Sorry, monkey's barking, so I'm trying to mute myself. Mm -hmm. um, well, I just wanted to say, Ashley, I'm literally signing to same, same as you're saying this, because in my relationship, it's sort of been um, a similar situation that with my boyfriend, Monk, 
with my boyfriend, um, you know, watching movies is, it's not enjoyable, it's more stressful. And so I take my implants off and I read and it is glorious and he can watch boxing and watch whatever it is that he likes to do. And we just being present together and doing what we both love um, feels really nice. But I think to add to what you were saying, Ashley, is that whether you're in a relationship as someone with Usher syndrome or anything else, communication is crucial. And as soon as that communication breaks down and when we are living in codependent relationships, there's a, a very popular well-known book called Codependent No More by a woman named Melody Beattie. And um, it's very, it's, she's well known in the Al-Anon community, which is for people who are loved ones of someone who is an addict. Um, but it's really, I think, can relate to anyone who lives with codependency. Um, it's, I, I, I highly recommend the book. But the point is that communication breaks down um, in any relationship. And what's unique about having Usher syndrome is you actually have an incredible ability to develop the type of intimacy that I don't think I, I would have ever been able to develop with a partner had I not had Usher syndrome. And so I want to also open up uh, people to that possibility that you do have to develop that comfort with yourself of seeing yourself not as flawed or broken or lesser than or um, needing to be fixed in some way. Um, that, that when you're able to see yourself that way, that you will choose a partner who also sees you as someone who is an equal and not someone they need to take care of or someone that they um, can, can you know, abuse in, in any way. So it does start with you first. Thank you so much, Rebecca. This is Krista speaking. We have another live question. How do you cope with the self you used to be, things you could do in the past versus the self you are now, less vision, et cetera? Thinking about this makes me sad and I worry about it taking away my enjoyment of the present moment. I see a lot of heads nodding. Anyone like to start? Ashley, please. This is Ashley. Find a replacement. Find a replacement. What you enjoyed before and you can't do anymore because your vision transition, find something else. Like I couldn't see the TV. I couldn't watch movies. So now I read. That's my movie. And now I'm ready to read bit, start to learn Braille because it's becoming harder and harder to read. And I spent a long time reading. So now I'm learning to read Braille. So it's a progression. You know, you, you start at one place, don't get stuck there. Don't get obsessed in that place that you can't do anymore, what you can't do. Accept it, grieve it, and find a replacement for that. And that way you can move on. That's, that's what's worked for me. Thank you, Ashley. Rebecca? Yeah, this is Rebecca speaking. Uh, I, I absolutely agree with Ashley, but I do know that the grieving process is so painful. It is so incredibly painful. And I think that it is important because for so many of us on this panel, part of the reason why we're on this panel is because we have gone through the blood, sweat and tears of everything we're talking to you about today. And I sometimes find that I can forget just how difficult um, I, you know, things were for me uh, when I was 18, for instance, and I did everything in my power to hide the fact that I had hearing aids. And now I have cochlear implants and um, I'm more happy not wearing them when I go out and yet, you know, so there's just all of these ways in which my life has changed. But more importantly, the grieving process, I want to really validate how you're feeling because these losses are very real and it's very unusual for people to have to go through this perpetual state of loss on such a continuum for such a prolonged period of time. And so I want you to allow yourself for that and know that when you need to cry, do it. And you may feel it on a guttural level. It may feel so painful to you that you can't even imagine how uh, anything could, could feel as, as sad and as terrible to you. And that's okay, because that's what grief feels like. But I promise you that if you allow yourself to feel those emotions, and if you allow yourself to cry as much as you need to, that it will make room 
for the possibility and the space to explore the things that Ashley just mentioned, like transitioning to the things that you can do and that you can enjoy. Because there's also nothing more frustrating than trying to maintain doing an activity that no longer is enjoyable to you. I think trying to force yourself into that place that maybe no longer feels comfortable for you is more, uh, is, is more damaging than it is sort of helpful. So really allow yourself that time and space. And I can promise you that I have grieved that way. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. In the last few minutes that we have here, I'd like to ask all of the panelists to share what's, what's one piece of advice you'd like to give, one piece that you'd really want everyone who attended today to be able to walk away with. Do we wanna start with Deb? You're unmuted, so that could be easy. Yes, this is Deb. I'm scrambling for an answer for that one. The one thing, I guess reflecting back on the last question, um, there's a lot of grief resources out there and there's different ways to grieve. So I agree that in every day you can have rain showers, sun showers, and fun. And so it's not, I really like, I'm going to echo Rebecca's weather statement. The weather never stays the same. So don't lose hope that whatever it is right now is going to be forever. It changes. Thank you, Deb. Lisa, do you want to go next? Sure, this is Lisa speaking. And I um, will actually, um, well, a couple of things, I guess, uh, regarding grief um, of any kind, and especially with, with Usher syndrome, like Rebecca mentioned, grief is ongoing. There's not a single incident that you grieve and you get past. It's continuous loss and it's continuous grief. And unfortunately, um, the only way to get through grief, uh, to get past grief is to go through it. There's no um, shortcut and there's no way around it. Um, so I am um, a big, um, I support uh, finding a therapist, finding someone to talk to. And as a matter of fact, not uh, to quote Rebecca, actually I saw Rebecca speak on another panel where someone asked about mental health resources uh, for therapy for uh, people with Usher syndrome. And she recommended um, seeking out, if not a therapist that was a specialist in Usher syndrome, to find a grief therapist to work with. And um, because grief is such an enormous part of Usher's syndrome and it's so ongoing, um, I thought that that really made a lot of sense. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to say is, um, I actually, um, Rebecca made a statement about showing yourself grace. I actually had some notes prepared um, for today and I actually have that um, on my piece of paper here about showing yourself grace. And um, one of my favorite quotes um, is I believe a Buddhist quote that your compassion is not complete unless it includes yourself. So um, I hope that that, uh, I, I, I bear that in mind often. And I hope that if um, that resonates with anyone, that can be something that can be uh, helpful to you. Thank you, Lisa. And Ashley and Rebecca, we'd love to hear one last piece of advice. Ashley, please. This is Ashley Pining. Rebecca said this more than once, but I follow her lead and I'll say it again too, real quickly find a mentor. Anyone that you can look up to and want to be like, I want to do what you do. I want to have that independence that you have. Use that mentor. Talk with them. Keep in touch with them. That's so important, mentoring. Expand your support system. You need a support system, people that you call can call on when you need support. If you want to go somewhere and do some something, even with family, not necessarily family or friends, but a support system around you. A healthy balance is important. Balance of your hopes and, and adaptability. 
you know, mental health is important, but really the balance, you know, being able to adapt, find something to replace what you did before, develop new tools, develop new skills. I find that a healthy balance. I don't obsess on one way of doing things or hopes that I may have had that have changed along the way, that adaptability. So those are my three tips that I find important for myself. Thank you, Ashley. Rebecca? Yeah, so this is Rebecca speaking. I wanted to recommend, and Krista, I'll send this to you. Um, a friend of mine, Mary Catherine Lamaster, she has RP, not Usher syndrome, but she has a website called breathebig.com. And she focuses on a lot of the mind-body connection stuff, spe specifically for people who have uh, vision loss, who have hearing loss. And so um, I think that some of, of, a lot of her meditations, I believe, are free. I, I um, will have to talk to my dear friend, Nancy O'Donnell, about potentially maybe getting interpreting for um, some of the other ones. Um, but all of the ones that you buy that are not expensive go towards the White Cane Project, which basically supports mobility instruction um, and training for the blind, so it's, it's she has a, a nonprofit. But so that was one thing that I didn't want to forget to mention. But here's what I can can give to you as my sort of last uh, food for thought or uh, input, and that is, you are not alone. And I think that it is so difficult, particularly in this virtual capacity, for us to really, uh, you know, connect as much as we would if we were in person, and yet maybe there are so many people who wouldn't be able to attend a conference because of proximity or expense or whatever. Um, what I can tell you is that it is an incredibly isolating experience, I think at times to go through grief or maybe to have Usher syndrome, particularly when you live in a family or maybe a community where there are not a lot of people around you who also have Usher syndrome. But I can promise you that we are all out here fighting the good fight. We are advocating, we are mentors, we are living very meaningful, very fulfilling lives. And um, there is a lot that is possible out there. And the last thing is that everyone on this panel that we've not had an opportunity to really show all of you today, given the time constraints, has a wicked sense of humor. There is tremendous humor that comes with living with Usher syndrome, that comes with living with grief, that comes with just being alive. So allow yourself to laugh at just how absolutely incredibly absurd so many of the things that we have to deal with, we have to face on a daily basis that you couldn't make up if you even tried, right? And these are little things um, from, you know, me just taking my dog outside. Last night I took her out, I was by myself. She, she pooped in an area where there was no light. I got a poop bag, gave it my best shot, felt around for her poop, eh, couldn't find it. All right, well, we gotta keep going. I mean, what are you gonna do? And I could feel sorry for myself or I could just sort of laugh at like the situation of you know just how completely out of my control it felt. So I'm sorry to use that as an example, but there's so many things that come in our lives that have tremendous humor. And if we don't have humor, it's gonna make it really hard to get through so much of what we go through. So please remember to allow yourself not only the grace um, to have that compassion for yourself, but also to, to allow your sense of humor to shine. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. This is Krista speaking. We're at the end of our session here. So I just wanted to wrap up, but thank all of the panelists and thank our interpreters. Thank you all for making this such a, a wonderful, important discussion. Uh, in my 12 plus years being involved with the Usher Syndrome Coalition, this has been talked about from the very beginning, the need for these resources for individuals in the Usher Syndrome community. And this right here is the closest I've ever seen it to have a number, and there's more of you, there's more individuals in the community that have mental health backgrounds, professionals, it's incredible to see. And so that's our dream to continue building this. So I just wanna thank you all for being on the panel and we'll keep building it from here and enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Thank you, take care. Thanks everybody. Thank you.